Hello and welcome to the Voice of the Patient podcast. We are the podcast working to change lives, that is, improve the quality of life through not only hearing, but truly listening to the voice of the patient. Hello, and thank you for your download of the Voice of the Patient podcast. I'm Zach Stearns, your host, and I want to give a brief introduction for this episode with Alan Fredendahl, a third-year PT student at the University of Michigan, Flint. And in this episode, he talks about his experience as a patient after undergoing bilateral patella fractures due to an IED while he was serving in the Army. It's a really amazing interview. I'm very thankful uh, for Alan being on the show, but I want to give a little information about it. We were at CSM in San Antonio uh, this February in 2017, and we actually recorded it just in a corner of the Hilton Hotel um, right after a great presentation at CSM. So there's a little bit of noise in the background being at CSM, and it was an amazing experience. Uh, so I wanted to give a heads up there, and I also wanted to draw attention to a great podcast episode to listen to after this by Dustin Jones at the Senior Rehab Podcast. He has an episode where he gives his recap from CSM, as well as a really fun conversation with uh, Dustin and a lot of other all-stars. And uh, I actually was fortunate enough to be at the same Whataburger as they were, and so they invited me over to the table, and it, it was an awesome conversation. It was a lot of fun. And in that episode, you will hear that I actually placed a bet with Dustin, and I lost that bet. And so to Dustin, I will honor that CSM 2018. See you there. And thank you all for listening to the voice of the patient. Enjoy. Hello, and thank you for tuning in again to the Voice of the Patient podcast. Today, I have a special guest of Alan Fredendahl. We are here at CSM in San Antonio, Texas. And I really wanted Alan to come on to the Voice of the Patient to tell his story. Um, Alan is a third-year physical therapy student from the University of Michigan Flint. He is currently on his first of three final clinical rotations in outpatient neurology. Prior to PT school, he worked as a clinical exercise physiologist after graduating from Eastern Michigan University. Prior to college, he served in the United States Army for eight years as an infantryman, intelligence analyst, and UAV drone pilot. He currently lives in Howell, Michigan, with his wife of five years, Marion, and their lab puppy, Lucy. Alan, thank you for coming on to the show. Thanks for having me, Zach. I appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. So first, I'll just hand it over to you. Could you tell your story as a patient? Yeah, so um, in the Army, um, first of all, in, in regards to physical therapy in the Army, even before I deployed um, in the military healthcare system, physical therapy is, is direct access. So you go to what's called the, the TMC first, the Troop Medical Clinic, which is kind of like the hub. And you usually get triaged by um, a nurse um, or even a, a nursing assistant. Um, and from there, based on your presentation, determines where you go. So, you know, prior to deploying just any sort of training injury, like a, a sprained ankle or some, or, or sore knees, mm -hmm. you always have access to physical therapy. Which is awesome. That's yeah. Really awesome. So I, I, I kind of grew up, since I was in the Army in my 20s, um, with having direct access to a physical therapist for, for musculoskeletal problems. Um, but I really needed uh, physical therapy after my deployment to Iraq in 2007-2009. Um, part of our mission was what's called route clearance. So we basically just drive down the road and, and look for bombs or try to get ambushed. Wow. We do, we do it at set times of the day, and with the goal being that um, convoys following us that were less armored and secure would be able to pass safely because we had already went out and, and caused all the trouble. Um, so my truck was hit by an IED, and I was in the gunner's um, harness, um, and so it rolled. No one was injured, um, but it rolled on its side, and they're, they're super heavy armored trucks. Um, and so the, the side that hit the ground got pushed inwards because of the weight from the top and uh, crushed my knees. And so I had 
well, then I didn't know what I had, but now I know that I had um, <laughs> I had uh, bilateral patellar fractures. Oh, wow. So I was flown out to Germany um, where I had uh, banding surgery. So they just put incisions on my knees and banded the, the pieces of the patella back together. Okay. So they're held in place by rubber bands. Um, and then um, went back home and went to Walter Reed. Um, oh, wow. What's Walter? What was Walter? Right. Um, and had physical therapy. So just um, learning to walk again after not being able to walk for a while, being on bed rest with the banding. Um, and then uh, going through physical therapy and then getting back to active duty after I was uh, cleared to go back to active duty. Wow. That's really awesome. It's an amazing story. And first of all, of course, we are so indebted to your service to the country. And with Walter Reed, for one, uh, there's a book called Run, Don't Walk. I've heard of it. Yeah. I really want to read it. I haven't read it yet, though. Same. So it takes yeah. place in uh, Walter Reed. So could, could you tell, tell us a little bit about what that experience was like, the rehab schedule, what it was like, what PT was like? Yeah, so luckily I was there after, um, you know, all the the bad stuff with Walter Reed, with, okay. um, you know, all the stuff you, you hear on the news. Um so I mean, it's a it's pretty um, as far as uh, military schedules go. It's a pretty chill schedule. Um, there's no obviously there's no physical training in the morning because most of the people there can't do that. Right. <laughs> yeah. But you still uh, you still get out of bed and you have to make your bed just like you're still still in the army. Um, you, you go and get food if you can, or it's brought to you. Um, and then it's just a lot of really I guess you could compare it to inpatient rehab. Okay. Um, like three hours a day. Um, and kind of just the, the normal um, musculoskeletal progression of rehab, um, a lot of um, isometric stuff at first, and then getting back to doing squats, and then getting back to running, and then you know, kind of the the how you how a, a textbook case would go. Eventually, going back to wearing my body armor and doing stuff with my body armor on. Um, it's kind of nice because the rest of the time it's you know it's called a wounded warrior unit. Um, and so you get a lot of time to go do other activities. So that, that was the cool thing about the schedule there is that you had PT and you had um, you had kind of a schedule, but evenings were always off and there there's always stuff to do because all these different um, like veterans focused charities were always offering to take us out and do stuff, which was another great part because we were always we were active in PT, but we were also active after duty hours. Right. Going on hunting trips and going to ball games and all this other stuff. So, yeah. um, yes. Well, it sounds like it would be a pretty, to me, terrifying experience to go through that, say, and then go to Germany and then back to the U.S. Uh, how did you cope with it? Um, I mean, I guess at the time it didn't seem as traumatic as it does now reflecting on it because there was such... Um, a pre-established structure and, and, and uh, plan in place, mm-hmm. um, and that's something I've always appreciated about military healthcare is the doctors and everyone have, were always completely transparent. Um, and I don't know if that's because um, I'm not, not worried about costs or anything because everyone has healthcare, but they were always transparent with what was going to go on and what the schedule was. Um, and I think just with the military mindset, just wanting to get back to active duty do pretty much anything. You don't want to be in bed. Right. <laughs> Having your food brought to you. Right. That's not like a normal human thing. <laughs> no, no, it's not the, that's not living the dream. Yeah, really, if you yeah. think about it. Exactly. So you made it back. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, and any issues with your knees going back in? Um, no. Um, I think, you know, I think okay, I have so just daily physical activity to thank for not having knee issues. Good. Um, the only time I ever had problems was um, when I got out of the Army and I stopped exercising every day and I, I put on um, even a lot more weight than I, that I have on now. I had really bad knee pain. Um, and, you know, I don't know if that's a combination. Just, just, just the weight or just the knee injuries or both. But right. Probably both, if I had to guess. Um, but, you know, since I've lost a little bit more weight and I've just stayed active every day, um, it hasn't been an issue. Right. Okay. Well, um, based on your experience as a patient, you pursue physical therapy as yeah. a profession. Can you talk about how that mindset, how that decision-making process happened? Yeah, I think my, you know, 
even though it's a different background that got me to needing PT, I think it's pretty typical of, of people who are uh, pursuing PT or already PTs in our profession, that they had an injury and they had a really great physical therapist and they have their physical therapist to thank for getting them back to where they were. Um, and so, I mean, that's it. I guess I'm pretty stereotypical in that way. Um, in the Army, too, it, you kind of, uh, the physical therapist is an officer, and I was an enlisted guy, so you kind of listen to what the officers tell you to do. Right. So it was, you know, they kind of have that authoritarian role, but they're still not, they're not, you know, they're not drill sergeants. So sure. they they still have that empathy and, and compassion um, that I really enjoyed. I loved how much time they got to spend with me. Like I said, we, it was very intensive. Um, we were all spending a lot of time down there. Mm -hmm. And not only just with me, oh, but being in the open gym with, with other people, so, just yeah, seeing all the stuff they were doing, good. working yeah, with yeah. amputees, and oh, no, right. right. just right. like okay. compared to that, like mine is pretty is pretty good. mild yeah. to watch right. them teach people how to walk again with mm -hmm. one prosthetic or two prosthetics or three or four prosthetics. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. True. So looking back on it now as uh, in your position in PT school, looking back on your experience with those providers, what did you really appreciate? from what those therapists provided and also maybe what are some things about physical therapy that you would do differently as a therapist? Um, looking back now, I just, I mean, I guess the structure of, of a therapy session is, is important to me because um, it was always very well structured, very well planned. It wasn't kind of ad hoc. It was always one-on-one. -on -one. Okay, good. Um, which which is, is something that I'm very passionate about now is having one-on-one -on -one sure. care. Um, and it was always with a therapist, um, never, um, you know, in, in the military, there's no rehab tech aide who's a high school student. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone is, <laughs> who just was told exactly, oh, this is how you do an elbow yeah. curl and that's it. You're yeah. good. You're good to go. Right. right. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I wasn't there while they were doing any of the, the cool stuff that they're doing now, like with uh, blood flow restriction, but just having access to the best care for the patient is, you know, is what I got from that. Sure. They're always, you know, the military is always on the cutting edge of, of rehab. Right. Awesome. Okay. So could you tell our listeners, for those of us, including me, who uh, we don't have experience in the military. We're not in the military. We don't have family members in the military. We have some friends but as providers, we really want to be able to connect on a cultural level with those who serve yeah. in the military. What do we need to know? I think the first thing you need to know is, is you need to accept that you'll never be able to fully connect right. the okay. way that another, um, another okay. veteran will be able to connect. Fair enough. Um, uh, during undergrad, I did observation hours at the VA in Ann Arbor, and uh, the PTs there were all civilians, and they're always complaining about how easy I could just... just jump into a conversation with someone and just have that instant report. Yeah. Because um, it's, it's just, it's a military thing that you, you, once you find out someone else is a veteran, you just, it's like you've known them all your life. Yeah. I have two funny bits about that. One, one of my clinicals was at the VA and I was there with a classmate who served in the Navy and I felt exactly that, that I would go, th I would go through so much trouble trying to, yeah, let's talk about this. Let's talk about... I don't even like motorcycles, but I'll talk about motorcycles. I'll find yep. something to talk about. And I was like, oh, oh, uh, yeah, I was in the Navy. And then it's like, okay, so that's it. That's instantaneous. And then the second little funny story that I just experienced in a different rotation was that there was a visit from the Joint Commission. Okay. And there was a tech who is it's really just a, a job after retirement for him. And he served in the Navy. He was, in, he was a corpsman. And so one of the main uh, staff from the Joint Commission that came also served in the Navy, and they spent so much time talking about that that really the whole uh, the whole clinic there was safe, fine, no issues <laughs> because they bonded over serving in the Navy. I've had that experience multiple times. It's it's one of the reasons I chose the school I did is because two of the professors and faculty were mm -hmm. um, Army vets who had went through uh, Army Baylor as PTs. Oh, um, um, so I guess just recognizing that you'll never get that 100% mm -hmm. level of, of street cred. Right. And just recognizing that and, and not trying to come off as, as overly overly interested. Because <laughs> um, we can tell. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's true. I can, I can imagine that it just, it just it totally comes off as not so genuine. Yeah. But yeah, it's just, it, there's such there's such a desire. Really, if you go into PT, you really want to relate with people. You like this yeah. somebody that really likes people. And I think you, I think you still can relate to them, just knowing that you know um, if you're working um, 
whether you decide to go into the military as a PT or to uh, become like a, a civilian employee of, of, of the government and working with military veterans, if, if they're on active duty, they probably want to get back to active duty mm-hmm. and just know like they like to be pushed. Mm-hmm. They don't want to be seen as, um, as someone that's, you know, disabled or, right. or um, and just knowing that they, they are naturally active and self-motivated. And that that's a really easy way to kind of get them to buy in. Like they they want to be pushed as much as they can. Sure, and that makes sense. I I had a patient on at the VA who every, every time I would pick us do a set of whatever ten or twelve, and then he would say oh, one more for the core. And yeah. So he'd yeah. add another one, and it was really fun. And it really taught me though that I can't just be a softy. Yeah. yeah. That that really you need to respect the dedication, the commitment. And the resilience uh, for those yeah. for those who served, and to actually really honor them by making sure that your treatment is challenging. Yeah, and so I, that was something that I really learned, and I, we, we appreciate uh, uh, hearing that from you. Now, as a, as a future physical therapist, soon, very soon, to be a licensed physical therapist, uh, how has your experience in the military influenced your mindset as a provider? Um, you know, I'd say it goes back to just like something I'm really passionate about is, again, that one-on-one care, like high-quality care, um, and, and just really pushing people, implementing those strength and conditioning principles into our interventions, um, you know, death of three by ten with their bands. Um, yeah. Just, you know, just because someone is not a military veteran doesn't mean you can't um, really push them to their edge, because, you know, what doesn't challenge you doesn't change you. Right. That's so, a good point. That's a good point. And you're a certified strength and conditioning specialist, right? Mm-hmm. So, yeah. okay, yeah, so you definitely have that experience to be able to know about strength training and know how it's not just a mindless thing, that there's calculated way to dose exercise. Right. Yep. So we appreciate that. Because, you know, that, especially if you're working with the military population, you know, whatever you want to think about functional exercises, those, especially if they're in infantry or, or another physically active job in the military, they have to go back to that. So they, they, they're going to go back to wearing 40 pounds of body armor and a rucksack mm. and a camel bag and boots. They're going to be moving in boots, not tennis shoes. Right. So you have to, you know, kind of be aware of, of what their demands are going to be after they leave your care. Sure. That's a good point. Um, so you, you, you're doing them a disservice by not, by not rehabbing them properly. Right. Yeah, that's a great point, and it's a definitely a challenge for those of us who really we need to know, and that's that really comes down to our interview. It comes down to actually our talking to those who start to know what what do they need to get back to, like, yeah. because really uh, with all with with so much on your person that you're going to carry when you're mm-hmm. when you're out, on, uh, that that's that's different from being able to just walk out on the street. Yeah. So we would have to totally change what our goals are and to make sure that the goals really match what you're going back to. Yeah, and you know, I'm just thinking right now another thing that is kind of um, ignored in the military is like tobacco use okay. and nutrition. And those are, if you're working with the military population, those are great points to try and, and change behavior on because mm. almost everyone smokes. Yeah. They don't smoke, they chew tobacco. Some of them do both. Yeah. It's, you know, um, instead of water, when they're on the base, they drink monster energy drinks. Right. So, like, um, there's a lot of other factors that you really need to tease out with that military population. And a lot of those habits carry over into civilian life, too, so... Right, you know, the thing to do is is when you're doing your evaluation on a, on a new patient is to find out if they are a veteran because mm. they're more likely to smoke. Right, they're more likely to not have the best nutrition. Sure, in the military, the nutrition is what's in the chow hall. Yeah. So, <laughs> and it's not always the best. And those habits follow you when you when you get you know when you get out of the military. That's a good point. That's a, that's a really good point. Um, so, thinking about you moving forward. What are your thoughts, career goals? You know, I was really, really um, looking back uh, or looking at going back into the Army as, as a physical therapist. I looked into it prior to school um, by trying to do something with the National Guard. But there's not, where I live in Michigan, the Michigan National Guard doesn't have any physical therapy positions. So I'd have to either drive out of state every month for my, for my monthly commitment or move. Uh, I, I've looked um, 
at going back in. Um, and I was really looking into, uh, you know, putting in my packet for commission as an officer and a physical therapist. But I think that the recent election has changed <laughs> not only my mind a little bit, but my wife is definitely, you know, that's the first okay. thing she said. She said, we're not going to. We're not going to go back into the army. Right? <laughs> hey, that's you know that's honest, and you know we're, we try to be a neutral. Yeah, yeah. But hey, listen, I I completely I completely understand the hesitation because it's a big commitment. Yeah, and you, and you don't know what will happen, and so it's it's a tough. Thing. And it, I think more more than just the, the political landscape is just you know if if there were to be more um, conflicts, right? You know is. As a physical therapist in the military, you are also an officer, and so it can change rapidly from not treating patients to um, doing more of a leadership, military leadership role, mm-hmm. which is probably not going to be direct combat, you know, right. giving out frontline manipulations or something. <laughs> but but so um, quick, right yeah, before you head out, yeah. Just, yeah. But you know, um, getting into more logistics and getting away from patient care, which which doesn't interest me. Right. Um, that's why I got out in the first place. I don't. I don't want to go back into that. Right. Um, so, so I'm, right now, I'm deciding between um, doing either a, a neuro or ortho residency, and then my end goal is to be um, to go through fellowship through okay. AOMS. Great. Yeah, that's actually where we first met in person at the AOMS conference. Yes. Could you talk about? By the way, while we're talking about you, can we talk about your involvement with AOMS? What do you do? Yeah, so right now, um, last year I served on the, the student special interest group as the conference chair, and this year I'm the, the student special interest group president. Um, and so my, my goals for this year are just to get more people involved in AOMT, which is the American Academy of Orthopedic Manual Physical Therapists. Um, and, you know, something that drew me to AOMT originally is that a lot of the AOMT leadership are military veterans. Oh, you know, and in fact, a lot of a lot of, if you look at the physical therapy as a whole, a lot of our big leaders are military veterans, sure. which, I, you know, I sat in a talk earlier um, about South College, and one of the things they ask on their application, one of the things they wait on their application is if you have military experience or not. Mm-hmm. So I think it's, it says a lot when, when so many in our profession um, are, are military veterans. I agree. I agree. Absolutely. Um, well, it's awesome to hear about what you've been doing, what you will do, and about your experiences, and we really appreciate that. And so, how can our listeners reach out to you with comments or questions? Uh, so, you can always email me. My email address is alan.frendall at gmail.com, so A-L-A-N dot F-R-E-D-E-N-D-A-L-L. Mm-hmm. And then, um, same first name and last name, Alan Frendall is my Twitter handle, um, so I'm Always answer emails. I'm always active on Twitter. Awesome. Yep, you definitely are. <laughs> <laughs> and we all appreciate that. So is there anything else, any final parting words of advice to one, to students, or two, to those who will be working with veterans or those actively in the military? Um, you know, it's very, it's such a rewarding experience to work with, with military veterans because, you know, it's, you know, Aside from athletes, it's another population where people are almost always 100% motivated to get, to, um, get back to their normal level of function. Mm-hmm. And so it can be really rewarding to work with them and just knowing how knowing how to relate to them as best you can and how to really push them. Mm-hmm. Sure. Awesome. Thank you so much, Alan. Thank you to our listeners for tuning in again. And we appreciate your uh, listening to this podcast. And keep up the good work. Keep listening to the voice of the patient from CSM 2017 San Antonio. Thank you. If you enjoyed this episode, go to thevoiceofthepatient.org where you can find other helpful podcasts and blog posts that will show you how to improve healthcare through not only hearing, but truly listening to the voice of the patient. Thanks for listening. This podcast is brought to you in partnership with the Senior Rehab Project at SeniorRehabProject.com.